I had a couple break-ins in my house, and it left me with a feeling of uh, a lot of thoughts about violence, about guns, about frustration, about protecting your family, uh, lingering feelings that uh, you're left with. And uh, I thought it'd be some kind of a spark to make an action movie and a bit of a fantasy role playing. <laughs> Uh, because in real life, you know, you should do what I did, which is keep the damage and the violence to a minimum and get the heck out of the way. But the truth is, you know, afterwards you're left with a feeling of, I wonder what I could have done if I had to, and I kind of wish I'd had to. This character, he's a bit of an unhinged guy. I mean, he is uh, almost as far as you could say an anti-hero. He is a difficult guy. He's been acting as a dad and a good citizen, but he's been swallowing a lot of frustration for the length of this, uh, this time where he's hiding out. It's a persona that he's taken on will willingly. He wants to be a dad. He wants to have a family. He wants to be a part of society. There's a sense, the story that is told uh, a little over halfway through the movie where he talks about having been a violent person, giving somebody a chance to go back to uh, the life of a, of a good citizen, and, and watching that person do that successfully and thinking, wow, if he can do it, maybe I could too. You know, uh, there's, this, there's a feeling I have that a person who's broken through to a place of violence in the world and sees the world that way, maybe somebody who served in the armed forces or um, in this case, my character, you could say, did uh, special ops work, um, that that person might feel uh, distanced from a regular person who never did that and, and doesn't have that as part of their life and wouldn't allow it in, violence and pushing and hitting and shooting and <laughs> violent reaction. Um, and so I had this sense that this guy would have the feelings that I had times 10. And so he is really unhinged. Chris Lloyd, I mean, we needed somebody uh, to play my dad and somebody who had a wild hair in them, a feeling of like, that guy's crazy. He could do crazy. There's a number of older actors who you could imagine we thought of, but oh my God, nobody like Chris Lloyd fills that bill. Nobody brings that sense of chaos and mayhem that might break out, as well as a twinkle in his eye, like a real delight in craziness happening around him. Ilya Nyshuler is the director of Nobody, and he's from Russia, and he made a movie about three years ago called Hardcore Henry, uh, that he made for nothing. And Ilya had told his agent, I would like to make, I'm gonna try to quote him right, I would like to make an action movie with uh, an actor who does drama who used to be a comedian. And, and so uh, <laughs> I guess I was tailor-made for his uh, dream. And then we had this great script from Derek and we were thrilled to have Ilya, who's a funny, interesting guy and he just made it sing. To me, the fun of doing this and the challenge of it is to learn that new set of skills. So I also knew I had to get right into it. So um, thankfully we had Kelly McCormick interested and on board as a producer. And she and David Leach are connected to a, a group of stunt people here called 8711, the best stunt people in the world as far as I'm concerned. And they had one of those people, Daniel Bernhardt, who's, I think, maybe the best stunt actor in the business. And you might know him from Atomic Blonde. There's a huge fight he does with Charlize Theron. It's, it's really a, a, another level. And uh, Daniel's the best. And uh, he's also an actor, so he was able to really relate to me and my journey into doing stunts. And we trained three times a week, 
I had to drive down to the airport, which is where their uh, facility is, and train for two hours, two and a half hours. And I did that for two years before we made this movie. I'm excited for you to go on a crazy adventure and get swept up in the rage and violence and excitement and explosions and revenge of a regular guy who gets to act out this fantastic, very unrealistic uh, action story. Well, first of all, I'm a real big fan of Bob, Bob's work, and he's just always had this uh, this very special presence on screen. And um, and I like the idea of this being um, a film that really uses a lot of genre uh, ideas, and of course, lots and lots of action. But at the same time, also questions our whole belief system about what is masculinity. You know, why do we think that masculinity is like this big, beefy guy who, you know, is, uh, you, you know, looking, I don't know, like some kind of ideal, you know, maybe those kind of guys are not so fantastic and maybe they don't look like that. And maybe, in fact, the very guy that you think is a nobody might be, you know, more dangerous, in fact, often is more dangerous than the people that we set up to be these uh, masculine ideals. I was really attracted also to the writing about the relationship between Becca and her husband because it's very rare that in both TV and on film that we get to see the reality of a long marriage. You know, how hard it is to maintain intimacy across uh, careers, uh, and the humdrum, the repetition of life. How do we maintain um, real um, affection when um, our lives have become boring? This is the story of a family. Normal street, normal house, normal people, uh, which is revealed to be very different by this one single incident on a bus. A, a cruelty that we see all too often but that ends up having a very different outcome than uh, anyone would have expected. And, and that sets in motion an, a much greater disaster. Um, but this disaster at the same time helps this family come to terms with who they really are. Bob is a really um, smart and kind person. He, uh, has just been so uh, fun to be around with and we've had a lot, a lot of really um, fun, fun times doing all of these scenes together um, and, uh, and I don't know what else to say except you know he's just super bright and super fun and a kind person. When I first got this script um, you know I'm an action fan lover uh, there's a lot of action in the, in the, uh, written in the screenplay, as well as uh, twists and turns of the sense of a character who just basically walked away from a dangerous life, a lot of bottled up energy. And then this bottled up energy is going to be released. Uh, I found that exciting. And then when I got to the character of Harry, uh, I thought it would be something fun for me to do. I think this team, you know, Bob Odenkirk, Christopher Lloyd, DeRiza. Uh, it's an unlikely team of guys you put together in an action film, but I think it's similar to the first guy who discovered that he could put cheese and pickle on a burger and it'll taste good, you know what I mean? Working with 8711, uh, one of the best stunt teams in the business. Uh, so many great films they've been involved with, and I've watched their work and admired their work. You know, I've been watching their work ever since the raid, and uh, getting a chance to work with that team, uh, Greg and all the guys was uh, very comforting. Uh, they had a great uh, previous of of the action. Um, you know, they they took the time to, to you know to you know to show me the moves, and you know from the first day I got on set, 
uh, if you host, we host, we host, we host, we host, we host. And uh, actually, I think I lost about five pounds and gained a couple of muscles working on this movie. Our director, Ilya, really has a knack for action films. Uh, he has a knack for punchlines uh, within the action. And um, I'm, I was very pleased uh, to work uh, on this film, you know, really to be at his service, you know. I'm a fan of uh, Hardcore Henry. <laughs> and um, I'm glad that he's back on the scene making these type of movies, and I'm looking forward to what he has next. He lived for it. He loved the shooting and the killing and the danger and the risk and the intrigue and the adventure. He just loves it. But he's retired. He's in a retirement home. Uh, and he worries about his son. He's involved with something that's scaring him, the son, and is very dangerous. I'm just hoping he wants to use me again. <laughs> really, I mean, I just really like, <clears throat> I'm comfortable with him. <clears throat> I pick up so much from him. And he really knows what he's doing, technically. I mean, he's on it. Oh, they're great, you know, they're, they're right on it. And um, I have my main battle tomorrow and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. When I started reading it a little closer, on the second pass maybe, I realized that it really is a story about addiction. Now, it's very vague, and this is, maybe I was grabbing at straws, but I remember talking to Bob and talking to Derek Kolstad, the writer, and I was like, guys, is it just me, or is this a story about a guy who has been 20 years clean, not a single violent act, he overcorrected, became this, this nobody because he thinks this is how people live because he's never had a regular life until the age of 30 something that got me very curious it's about a an unhappy man rediscovering and accepting himself uh, in a much more violent form who um, stops running and embraces uh, his very dark self it isn't he's an anti-hero and it's always been a film to me about an anti-hero who we're, again we're masquerading it as a as a dude who's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a fantasy for the suburban dad and for some people they'll only see that level of it and they won't see the subtext and that's fine but everything that happens to the film like i said earlier is because hutch makes the wrong choices they're the right choices for him they're, they're not right choices for his family for his well-being etc you see wonderful thing with bob is that you know, apart from being a great actor and a great human being, and a writer, which is a uh, an odd, com not an odd, but it's a rather a rare combination. But you point the camera at Bob, and you see that their gear is turning. Whether they are or not, I don't know, but every single time we shot, a little bit of Bob goes a long way. So, you know, very lucky to, um, very lucky to be working with a guy like that. Daniel Bernhardt is the guy that trained Bob for a year and a half. Uh, Daniel has been in an amazing number of movies, big and small, as lead, as stunt, as double, everything. This guy pushed Bob and taught Bob uh, everything he knows for this, for this movie. So it was amazing that we got Daniel to fly out and be that thug because he can act. He's got uh, the shorthand with Bob when he tells Bob, Bob, this is great. It's working. It's probably stronger for an action scene, not probably, it's stronger to hear, for Bob to hear it from Daniel, who's an expert who's been doing this thing for 30 years. What I loved about seeing, about what I saw, is that this was not easy for him, not yet. And he was sweating, uh, he was getting tired, but he was going at it. He was still persevering. He'd get up, he'd go again, and one more time, let's do it again. And he'd collapse, he'd go up, he'd get punched, punch, and again. And there was something incredibly raw and real about what I was seeing. And I'm not exaggerating the slightest. It really was, I came out of that 8711 building going, I hope we get to make it because 
this is, I, I would want to see this I, as an audience member, first and foremost. Because the first thing you want to do, if you're considering any project, whatever it is, is like, do I want to see it? Would I pay money to see it? Would I be excited to see it? And seeing Bob doing all these things, even though the script was great and I knew that was, we were going to make that work, seeing Bob in action was just electric. Our approach to action at 8711 has always been to train the actors to do as much as possible. And so um, when we presented that task to Bob and say, that's how we make it unique, that's how we make it fresh, we take someone who's essentially an everyman and like transform him into someone who you could believe could pull this stuff off, um, you have to put in the time. And um, Bob took the challenge wholeheartedly and uh, you know, dove into the training. Um, and I think we all thought that that would um, accelerate the film and get it made and, we'd, you know, we'd be moving soon. But I think two years later, Bob is still committed to doing the training. Uh, and um, we still haven't figured out a way where we're going to make this movie. And uh, when Universal came on board, it was exciting because now, you know, Bob had never um, given up hope on, you know, this movie coming to life. And he spent all that time being consistent in like learning stunt fighting, transforming himself physically, becoming a better athlete, um, becoming a stuntman essentially. And um, you know, if he hadn't done those two years sort of off and on with Daniel Bernhardt, you know, part of our team, um, you know, this movie wouldn't be in the special place that it is. It's a movie full of wish fulfillment, you know, we're a, a a guy has sort of settled into his life um, in middle class America as this sort of every man, you know, you know, 2.5 kids and white picket fence. Um, and really, it's not that it's unsatisfying, it's just that there's a frustration to it and sort of the, the rules of society and like the way he has to live. Um, and <clears throat> there's a moment, a pivotal moment in this story where he has to transform back to the person that he was and that's actually a relief for him because he's been sort of repressing his his real his real nature and um, you could say his real masculinity I guess in a sense. Riza again like added um, as he always does a certain sort of swagger to a role and um, an authenticity and uh, an attitude which you know you know just comes from him doing it a lot and, and being really, you know, close to himself and like who he is. And um, we were really excited to, to get Risen. It was a really get, a big gift for us. And uh, I was excited to see him on set for sure. As a filmmaker myself, um, you never get noticed by making sort of safe choices. And um, what I see with Ilya's work is that he's knowledgeable in story. He's great with characters, but more importantly, he, he swings for the fences and he wants to be provocative uh, in his imagery um, and his style. And I think um, with these small movies, you have to strike a pose. And so I was excited when the group decided he would be the guy. And, that, and I think Bob was a really big fan and a huge supporter, as well as Kelly and Braden and, and Mark. And so um, I think we got lucky. When you're dealing with an actor like Bob and his physicality and, um, you know, what he looks like, I think we wanted to just, you know, flip it on its head and, and blow it out and just say, like, we want to make this sort of shocking, you know, and not, and, and grounded and a little disturbing and, like, and uh, I think it works better for the character and I think it works better for the film. I just fell for the idea. There was something about that it really came from Bob and Bob's experiences and sort of his own wish fulfillment of sort of re redoing some things that had happened in his life kind of that I just fell for and um, huge fan of Better Call Saul and um, Breaking Bad before that and also his comedy stuff and I was like I actually can see those being stepping stones from his comedy work to like him being that every man that people could really connect to and I just like jumped in hook line and sinker. Nobody's about a guy who has settled into the American dream. Um, perf you know, amazing wife, great kids that 
you know, classic teenager who's just kind of picking at you just enough, um, you know, and you're starting to sort of settle in and then kind of almost settle in too much, right? And, uh, and then his house is broken into and a fair family heirloom and a couple other things that mean a lot to him are um, taken and it flips a switch in him and he um, not only gets his stuff back and, you know, a lot of people up, but he also finds his uh, mojo and it's about reconnecting with his wife and family and coming back into the best version of himself that he had lost along the way. Connie is a hugely awesome addition to the movie too. I really wanted to focus on actresses with Ilya, of course, and Ilya driving it that um, w brought a warmth to the character and um, and a sophistication and a complexity um, because she has to do a lot with not a lot of time and you know, there's a way to play that role that is really sort of divisive and separate and cold and they're very different people living different lives. And I think we really tried to, we wanted to have the opposite, um, that there's still a lot of love there, but it's just complicated. And I think she brought that beyond and I feel so lucky to have had her. When Bob, uh, when his son was around 14 or so, which is the, in the film that the son is a 14 year older. Around that time, I don't remember exactly, they, the Odenkirks had a home invasion in their home and <clears throat> everyone was safe. Um, the, uh, Bob kept the, the, in, the in, intruder downstairs, they called the police, the family stayed outside, the family were coming home. Um, and uh, when the police were cleaning everything up, the guy had been taken away, and the policeman said to Bob, you did the right thing. It's not what I would have done. You did the right thing. And the other cop came along and said, just stop it. Don't, don't pay attention to him. And apparently that really messed with Bob's head. And he came in and shared it with me. We certainly talked about the home invasion. He shared that with me. And uh, we, it began uh, a real meditation or deep dive into what does it mean to, as a father, uh, as a parent, as a, as a husband, to protect your family? How do you do that? When is the right time to have a gun? When is not the right time to have a gun? And it began a whole deep conversation about that. And we started talking about what are the films that have explored that? Because Bob comes from comedy, we kept Bob's inclination was to find a friend of his who writes comedy and they would write it together. And we, you know, I, I was one of those voices kept on saying, we actually, it's exactly what we don't need. We have you, you're gonna bring your character work. We need, we need an action guy. We need the guy who writes John Wick, the guy who writes Taken. Literally, we need that writer to write this film who knows what a third act is in an action film. And, um, and you know, we, high on that list was this writer named Derek Kolstad who, wrote the John Wick, the first John, uh, three John Wick movies. He's responsible for really architecting that trilogy. And um, he was a huge Bob fan from Bob's Mr. Show days, which so many people are, and got what we were doing, got the idea of doing a, a different approach to an action film, a more character-based action film. I've always called this film, my working uh, reference is uh, American Beauty meets Taken. It's a real treatise on the state of suburbia and it's an action film. Bob um, is someone who tends to, seems to be someone who people connect with on a human level. And he, they feel what he's feeling. And so when he walks onto that bus and chooses not to leave the bus and turn around and take these guys on, there is a, oh my God, there is a, you gotta be kidding me. There is a suspension of what's actually gonna happen here that isn't gonna be the case with your typical action star. So it's the notion of an everyday guy, me, you, put in a position to watch myself actually beat up the guys I, I really want to beat up. And not knowing if I'm going to win or get myself killed. Alexi is pure brilliance. 
um, Ilya knew, I don't know how well he knows him, but knew of him, certainly from Russia. He apparently is an incredibly well-known actor in Russia, living in Toronto. Ilya asked him to put an audition on his iPhone and just mail it to Ilya. So we were up here in Winnipeg before, uh, three weeks before shoot, and we still hadn't cast the role, and Ilya hands up, holds up his iPhone and says, look at this guy, and he danced for his audition. He, he danced this dance when he was gonna be on stage for the uh, karaoke piece. And we frankly didn't even need to hear his, uh, his dialogue audition piece when we saw him with so much comfort and swagger and fun. Now, staying with the action theme, did you know that the role of John McClane in Die Hard was originally offered to Frank Sinatra, who was 73 years old at the time? Why was he offered the role, you ask? Well, Die Hard is actually based on a book that follows a detective named John Leland, titled Nothing Lasts Forever, which is a sequel to the book, The Detective. Now, a movie version of The Detective was made starring Sinatra in 1968. Sinatra turned down the role, so for the purpose of continuity, the movie changed the character's last name to McLean. Hmm, interesting, no? Now remember to click here to subscribe on the side for more great content.